Moish Postone is a professor of history at the University of Chicago. He is also a heterodox Marxist of some import and the author of Time, Labor, and Social Domination, a reinterpretation of Marx's capital, along with other books and essays such as Catastrophe and Meaning, Critique, State, and Economy, and others. Moish Postone, welcome to the Zero Books podcast. Thank you, Doug. I was really glad that you agreed to talk to me. Lately, I have rediscovered you. It's not as though I, I, I didn't know of your work before, but I have been reintroduced to your work by the algorithm at YouTube, and I've been watching some of your lectures, Oh, and um, I thought it would be a good idea to reach out to you because I find what you are saying so interesting, and I'm so tempted to mostly agree with you, that is, if I understand you. So thank you for giving me the chance to talk, and uh, uh, we'll go over some things here. Um, to start with, what's most surprising and controversial about your kind of Marxism, your reinterpretation of Marx, is that you say that rather than labor, working people, being the revolutionary subject of history, that capital – and capitalism maybe is the subject, and that history itself, as we know it, is some sort of byproduct of capitalism. I think I'm kind of jumping to the end of your ideas here, but am I getting that right? Oh well, I would use slightly. I wouldn't use the word byproduct. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I mean I can try to elaborate. Yeah, that. please, please do. Well, I think that. Um, Marx was more than a spokesperson for the oppressed. I think Marx is the most significant social theorist of modernity. And the way he tried to understand modernity was as capital. And in a sense, when I, picking up on, on Marx, argued that the subject, now subject in Hegel's sense of the driver of history that unfolds, he uses that language in speaking of the category of capital. And so the question is, what does he mean by that? And I think that one of the many things he's trying to elaborate is the question of why does the modern period, modern history, modernity, capitalism, have a sort of a dynamism that no other form of human social life has had. To say that it has dynamism does not necessarily mean that that is a good thing. It's descriptive. And the category of capital with Marx's emphasis on time is, among many other things, an attempt to explain why capitalist modernity it not only has a dynamic, but is accelerating. And I think that a focus only on issues of exploitation, which of course is also central to Marx, but an exclusive focus on questions of exploitation and property doesn't get you at this fundamental feature of modern social life. The dynamism. Um, let's start there. Now, what you're talking about is technological innovation, primarily? Well, it can't be reduced. Yes, it's technological innovation, but it is the increased use of technological and ongoing use of technology in production. It's not, let's say, in the past. You've had technological changes but you would have a change and then you would have a new form that remained fairly stable for a long period of time. Here you have ongoing technological change, which means ongoing social change, which also means ongoing geographical change. Having read Capital, I, my thought here is that what drives this dynamic is the need for individual capitalists to innovate their productive processes in order to compete and outproduce and produce more profits than other 
capitalists in their field. So you have this constant drive to innovate production. And that exploitation and Marx's value theory is, is really the explanation for that dynamic. I mean, but and you would agree with that, right? Yes. You know, the book, Capital, is the subtitle is a critique of political economy. And it doesn't mean only a critique of the economic order of capitalist modernity, but also it's a critique of theories of political economy, and I would suggest of Hegelian understandings of history. And by critique, what Marx does is not simply say that people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo or Hegel are wrong, but rather to try to explain what is it about capitalist modernity that allowed them to think the way they did. And in a sense, Marx's notion of capital as this social form which is incredibly dynamic and unfolds over time and imparts a logic to history is the social basis for Hegel's notion of the subject, which means a logic of history that unfolds. Hegel, like Adam Smith, now I'm, I'm sort of channeling Marx as I understand him, uh, took what is specific to modernity and understood it transhistorically as a feature of, in Smith's sense, human social life in general, to truck, barter, and exchange, or Hegel, the notion of a sweep of all of human history. And in a way, Marx is saying there hasn't been that kind of sweep, but there is once you have capitalism. Okay. Does that, yeah, does that, that makes, help? Yeah, it does make sense. My, uh, you know, I've also read Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, which I understand some Marxists would say that's the wrong Hegel to read, like I should be reading the logic. But um, my understanding of Hegel is that he – is being a philosopher, he starts with some very core problems from modern philosophy, namely the subject-object split or the subject-object dualism or the problem yes. of perception. Yes. And it's based on that philosophical problem that he develops a theory of history and that's transhistorical. The, 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 that subject-object dualism is transhistorical. Um, does Marx reject that starting point that Hegel starts with in the phenomenology? No, I think Marx's way of dealing with it is slightly different. Uh, in the Grundrisse, Marx's, one of Marx's preparatory manuscripts for Capital, he refers to the categories that he uses, categories with names like commodity and capital, as forms of being in the world, of determinations of the mode of existence. In other words, what Marx, I think, is arguing is that the categories that he is using as social categories are categories of objectivity and subjectivity at the same time, or they are social and cultural simultaneously. And in that sense, uh, he is taking Hegel's notion of the, the dichotomy in modern Western philosophy between subject and object and embedding it socially, that the form of social life really conditions the way people think, including Marx, of course. That's the first leg, as it were. The second leg is that Hegel's solution of a ongoing historical dynamic, which is there in the phenomenology, uh, that this, what Hegel grabbed hold of, Marx says, is actually the movement of capital. And that in a way, older materialism couldn't grasp that. Hegel's idealism did without realizing that it actually was social. So I think what Marx is doing is he's taking someone like Hegel, 
like he took someone like Adam Smith and embedding them in his social categories of commodity and capital. So I find myself resisting a little bit of that, but I want to move on. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd be curious to know, but well, I'll tell you. I'll tell we, you why. I, res- I think that I, I just kind of, I do feel just in my everyday life that the difference between my own subjectivity and whatever it is out there in the world that's real is a is a universal problem that any perceiving being would have the problem that I experience. That um, without knowing it, my cat has the same problem, and. Um, that that is transhistorical, but that doesn't mean that everybody has to realize that problem all the time, or that that we've thought about the problem the same way forever. But I do feel like that insight into like the problem of perception is a transhistorical problem. That it starts the moment you are self-aware, or you know, I kind of believe Hegel's story at the beginning of Phenomenology, where you start with sense certainty and immediately that falls apart. So this is maybe I'm an, uh, being anti-Marxist here, but it, that but I don't want to. No, you'll notice you if I could interject. Yeah, you'll notice I use the metaphor of two legs. The first is that both your subjectivity and the objectivity that you perceive are socially conditioned. Yeah. That statement is transhistorical. But the the dynamism, which is the second leg, is historically specific. Okay, right. All right, so uh, we agree then. But you're the employees. You're the people who actually run this store. You can't let him do this to you. I mean, without you, he's nothing. He must be stopped. I don't know. Maybe Craig's not so bad. He did give me the Employee of the Month Award after I cleaned his aquarium. Employee of the Month Awards are the opiate of the masses. You people can't let fear run your lives. Are you going to act or suffer under Craig forever? The madness ends now. If you're going to think about this and maybe use an analogy, do we just start to set up different social games or different ways of behaving together um, as we go along through history to try to solve as we try to solve this first leg of the problem, and that the that we're playing a different, very different kind of game now that has its own rules, um, and one of the consequences of the rules of this game is this sense of linear history and this sense of uh, always pressing forward into the next new development. Um, I mean, is that, is, that, is that too simple of an analogy for what you're talking about? Yes and no, because the dynamism isn't really linear, and this would be extremely complicated for me to try to, uh, to simply elaborate. I think that Marx's dynamism is one that changes everything and yet tries to retain certain things as its own underlying basis. So that uh, it's not a simple linear progression, <coughs> even though it sets the stage for explaining why some people, starting with the Enlightenment, could think of it as a linear progression. And as dimensions of our society still do. The future orientation of financial capitalism or the self-understood future orientation of the quote-unquote visionaries in Silicon Valley is extremely linear. And the question is, 
you know, how does one understand that socially and how does one put together their visions of a linear progress that is going to be, that is really kind of utopian with the disaster of historical development of recent decades. And it seems to me that an adequate theory has to be able to explain both both of those legs. We're on different legs now. <laughs> okay. So, so the problem with, the, say, someone in Silicon Valley and their linear conception of history is it, it's just that it's, it's one-sided. That, for instance, if you – I've interviewed someone who um, – a man named Aubrey de Grey who's working on longevity research and repairing the body so that uh, we could live, he thinks, maybe a thousand years um, if you get his model Im- implemented and everything in place. Um, and, you know, he makes a certain amount of sense, especially if you're not a, a doctor or a biologist like I'm not. But uh, but I think he I, he also makes sense. I, I, there are people who are who take him quite seriously and he has a research foundation and all of that. But um, but the, the difficulty with his vision is that um, he imagines that once we have more time, basically individuals have more time, we'll have more energy and – resources in order to implement n- other solutions in other realms and that technological solutions like the ones he's suggesting for uh, to overcome aging will just present themselves for all these other difficulties as well. You know, what he's not taking into account is the kinds of social changes that will come along with something like eliminating aging that may undermine uh, our ability to, to think clearly or to develop other technologies or and, and so on. The way I see a lot of the suggestions that come out of Silicon Valley is they sort of zero in, it's cherry picking. They zero in and they pick what they see as one problem and they see it as being discrete. Then they try to come up with a sort of technologically based technology in the broader sense of the word based uh, solution to this one problem, but the problem exists in a dynamic context with a lot of other problems, and they're interrelated. And they don't seem to really get that at all. So in the case of aging, that problem is mixed with an economy that requires a certain sector of the population to get sick at a certain time in order to allocate resources to, to deal with that problem. In other words, there's, there, our society is structured to work with what we have, and when you make a change, it will have a ripple effect throughout, say, the economy or, and certainly through our social life. What you don't want, or at least I wouldn't, is that you have a, a segment, probably a smallish segment of the population, that have access to his technological breakthrough and live forever, and then there are the vast majority who not only don't have that access, but whose work and activities are the are one of the preconditions for that thousand year lifespan. Right, that's the real problem. Um, it's not so much a, a problem of redistribution; it's a problem of uh, can we conceive of, of a society which wouldn't require a class of people that are. Um, you know, exploited and oppressed in order to produce the kind of technology that he's relying on to create his big solutions for aging. Uh, right. And and that's a real difficulty. The accelerationist in me thinks, let's get that pill out there that will, you know, give some of us a thousand years. I'm all for it. And uh, at least I think I am. But, you know, and then see what the social consequences of that would be. Because I don't think very many people – would sit uh, sit still for this notion that they are going to you know live short and miserable lives while there's a cast of people who are going to live for a thousand years. I think that would be so stark that it would inspire social you know revolution. I'm afraid that I'm much more of a pessimist than you are in this regard. That in some respects we live in that kind of society right now, and it it. Uh, it gives rise to all sorts of forms of violence, but not the sort of organized, 
political counter violence that you seem to have in mind. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's then. That's the flaw with the accelerationist argument, really. Now you right. now. So let's go back to your theory about uh, history and how the dynamic of capitalism, the 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 two legs here, and and how we often will mistake changes in, in the capitalist system for more radical changes than they are. And uh, like for instance, I recently had a conversation with Slavoj Zizek. Who I think you may have met. He uh, he says he's a Marxist, and I asked him as if, as a Marxist, he held with the labor theory of value, and he mentioned you in his response and said that he, like you, did hold with it, but he wanted to say that we should desubstantialize the labor theory of value, which I didn't quite know what that meant, and he didn't believe that there was a connection between time worked and the value produced, for instance. And he pointed to Microsoft and intellectual property and the notion of rent to justify the idea that capitalism itself has changed and that we're no longer in, say, a Fordist period and that we have to reconceive core Marxist concepts in the face of the changes that, Mar that, that capitalism has produced. So my question to you is, does Zizek agree with you, like he says he does, and um, where do you stand in relationship uh, you know, to the labor theory of value and whether time and value are related. And um, yeah, those are my, my, my two questions. I guess I could throw in, uh, do you think that the changes that we've seen, like the, the rise of the importance of intellectual property and rent um, indicate a, a, a substantial change in the very foundation of the capitalist uh, dynamic? Those are very big questions. Uh I agree with uh, <clears throat> Slavoj Zizek's uh, statement that it's time to uh, desubstantialize value, the value theory. Uh, and I think what he means by it, certainly I would, is that the value theory does not simply mean you, that you have factories uh, and that value is really a theory of uh, stuff, the production of stuff. I think it's a much more complicated theory, but where I disagree with Zizek and a lot of the people who talk about intellectual property is that there's, a, there's an aspect of the value theory that I think has been overlooked by a lot of people, which is that uh, value for Marx is not the same as wealth. And most people think that Marx's theory of the labor theory of value is a Ricardian labor theory of wealth. That is to say that labor, direct labor in production, always and everywhere is the basis of social wealth. And I don't think that's what Marx did. I think Marx took that theory and he transformed value into a category of the form of wealth that is specific to capitalist society. Right. And if it is the that is and it's based on the expenditure of human labor time. Now, what Marx outlines, which a lot of people seem to have missed is that on the one hand, capitalism generates forms of productivity that really can't be captured in terms of the expenditure of human labor time. This is Marx writing long before you had the electronic revolution. At the same time, he argues, however, you don't simply have a smooth transition to let's call it a post-industrial society because capitalism remains structurally anchored in value that is in the expenditure of human labor time. So what you have is a system that is always pointing beyond itself and yet never being able to realize that which it points beyond. Uh, 
so that in a way, and this is where I really differ from a lot of Marxist tradition, unlike what seems to be the case in the Communist Manifesto, by the time Marx is writing Capital, he no longer thinks that the working class is going to get larger and larger and larger, and that post-capitalism, let's call it socialism, means that the working class workers will come into their own and that labor will be recognized as the source of wealth, where it's actually not in capitalism, although it actually is, but rather Marx is pointing to the trend in capitalism that empties proletarian labor of all content, diminishes proletarian labor, and yet holds on to it as the sine qua non of capitalism. Yeah. Well, see, there, so, yeah, well, go ahead. Let me fi- let you finish. So if you then say, so in a sense, to use a, a word that's fallen out of use because it was so misused by Stalinists and by Maoists, what I've outlined is what Marx considers to be a contradiction. That capitalism points beyond itself while it reconstituting its own basis, which is proletarian labor. If what you do is you take value and you say, well, intellectual property also is generative of value rather than of wealth, then what you're doing is you're losing out on that contradiction. And you've, got, you've developed behind your own back a much more linear notion of history. The point of the value theory of labor is that increasingly it cannot capture all the sources of wealth production and yet continues to structure our society. Does that make sense? Yes. And and what I told Zizek was that, you know, if you read Marx's Capital, he already has a theory that in, incorporates rent and that you don't need to go beyond his theory to fix a problem that isn't there. I mean, that... I mean, not not. It's not that Marx is always right, but if your objection is that he doesn't cover rent, he does, and rent is where you can be very profitable. You know, the uh, the landlords and the bankers are very profitable, but they're not the source of value. And that's and you know that that's not a contradiction. That's not a problem for Marx, um, and it doesn't require that we change his theory if that's your objection. But you know, and his response to that was typically to check in to say, yes, yes, of course, but, and then talk about, I don't know, a movie or something for. (laughs) Yes. It is an authentic complication, and I try to answer this complication with these limits of market logic that we witness today. For example, example, let me me just jump in real quick, Slovak, because I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, So the reason I brought up the labor theory of value is because if you hold with that and you're a vulgar Marxist like I tend to be, then you're going to think that Keynesian spending isn't going to produce a situation of stability that it will lead to perhaps could even lead to crisis in this moment where we where we have a decline in profitability. So like I believe in that the in the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, I believe in the labor theory of value. You know, I'm a good Christian boy. I mean, I'm a big fan of Slovak Zizek, but um it was a little frustrating to not be able to get him to engage that. But I think the same thing is true of his writings. I think that there are wonderful insights that then aren't developed and said there's a skip to something else. Do you think that's because he runs up against a problem that he doesn't know, that he can't solve or even start to conceive and then he skips to something else or is it just, I mean, I, I, I honestly yeah. don't know why I really don't uh, to come up with, I yeah. could describe it, but I don't think well, I, I could explain it. I think it's his it. strength think, and his weakness I, at the same time. I think that the fact that he, I would agree with that. Um, I mean, so in any case, let's go back to Marx instead of Zizek, which we, you know, I, I strangely find him endlessly fascinating, Zizek, uh, but in a way that probably is not helpful. So back to this problem of uh, labor as 
developing as the new subject of history, here's here's the difficulty. When you say that capital is currently the subject of history and not labor, you have uh-huh. moved us first of all, the the kind of the emotional reaction is that you you seem to be abandoning some of the ideas that have brought people to the left. Uh, the egalitarian principles that brought them there, the concern about the oppressed and the exploited. I mean, I don't think you really are abandoning those things, but you're maybe not making them central to your understanding of at least the subject of, of, of capitalism. But the, the other problem is that if you try to think up a way to overcome capitalism as a subject, you, I think, are naturally led to be kind of vanguardist given this conception, because there's no necessary reason to try to get everyone um, who's oppressed uh, involved if they're not the revolutionary subject of history. You know, you might as well try it on your own, since you've got the, at least the beginnings of an understanding. Um, And that is very off-putting to people who have seen vanguardist groups and, you know, remember the 20th century I think that the notion of the working class as the force, whether one calls it revolutionary subject or not, as the rising force that will continue to expand and gain in strength, and that the task is to work alongside that rising force to try to counteract tendencies to split it or to mislead workers, I think that that's a losing proposition today. I think it's been a losing proposition since the late 60s and when there were the beginnings of what we now experience as massive historical changes that have left much of the left without orientation. I think that historically, both the communists and the social democrats began, and now I think today totally, have lost plausibility. I think that people sense this, and it's not only because of the really anti-democratic and oppressive nature of what had been called actually existing socialism or the great number of exclusions that actually existed in the high point of capitalism, what we sometimes call Fordism. I think that the left has lost a vision of the future. I think that the old vision no longer holds. And partially as a response to that, there have been a tremendous number of spin-offs on the part of people who know something is wrong, a great deal is wrong, and there no longer is a a larger discursive frame to try to make sense of what has gone wrong. And I see identity politics as being part of this phenomenon with the I think, illusion that if different groups are identitarian, it will add up to a majority. But even if that's true, which it wouldn't be, even if that were the case, that doesn't give you a vision of a future society. And uh, what I am proposing is avant-gardist in a very specific sense not in an organizing sense, but in the sense that I think it behooves people who regard themselves as, let's say, progressive intellectuals to begin to try to think of or rethink what a post-capitalist society would look like. Because the issue of whether something is reformist or revolutionary depends not on the degree of violence or militancy, but whether it moves in the direction 
of a post-capitalist society or not. And if we don't have a vision of post-capitalism, because to be honest, the sort of implicit vision, while full employment for everybody and a more equitable mode of distribution is not going to work. That's been dead for 40 years. And I think it's a major historical challenge that has been sidestep avoided or just dropped by much of the left. Yeah, I mean, that, isn't, that has never been the Marxist vision of a socialist future in any case. I mean, the, the idea that we could, you know, just have full employment and proper distribution. Yeah, he's always been saying, Marxists have always said, you know, that the workers have to seize the means of production and change the fundamental uh, structure of our social life, the way we produce and reproduce our life. Yeah, but yeah. see, most Marxists say that, but what they really mean is that you have the same mode of production under collective ownership. Then one can argue whether that collective ownership is best expressed through you know, a centralized state or through workers' councils, which after all are fundamentally different. But that is essentially a political difference about how to administer what is a commonly shared vision of the mode of production developed under capitalism that is distributed and administered in a very different way. And I'm saying that we have to get away from that because I think it's a critique of the mode of production itself. Well, do you often get uh, charged with trying to create a blueprint for the future? Does, no, on the contrary. That's good. I'm charged with not having enough of a blueprint. <laughs> well... I mean, because, because, well, you're calling for a blueprint, it seems like to me, not rather than having one. It's like, um, and I find that, like, I'm a science fiction writer, so I can come up with scenarios that are fantastical as to what might, the, the future might be like. But when i done writing, I find that all I've done is taken some aspect of what is here now and made it dominant. Like, I'm writing a, a book about what if video games replace capitalist production. It's a crazy, dumb notion. But uh, I'm enjoying writing it. But it, but I find it very difficult to come up with anything serious um, to conceive to conceive of a different way of of organizing our collective work. Um, it doesn't seem to be something that people have done before. That in the, it, it seems like what happens and usually is that changes start to happen materially, and then you know they're managed and, and new forms emerge. But this is asking people to put the you know the horse before the cart <laughs> to, to actually consciously uh, create a new society yes I don't think that we can we're anywhere near being able to do any kind of blueprint okay. I do think however that we have to think seriously not about a society no longer a society that says that it is based on the working masses and as kind of symbolized by a hammer and a sickle, workers and peasants, but rather what does it mean to think of a post-work society that does not involve a global gated community of the vast majority of humanity being relegated to self-constituted informal economies, living in slums, basically, and policed, and a very small minority of the world's population, populating elite universities, knowing one another, being very diverse, uh, and essentially living the life of millionaires, not billionaires. And... In a way, I'm trying to suggest that that nightmare scenario, which is where I think we're headed, is a nightmare scenario which has as its root the value theory. That is, that human labor remains necessary for wealth production, even though it doesn't appear to be the case. So people are bound to work. 
And I think what we have to do is try to imagine what would it mean to have a post-work society? I mean, there are people in Europe who are, you know, guaranteed income is like one thing they talk about a lot. But guarantee income, while I think an important dimension of the problem, doesn't get at the question of how do you see to it, or should you even bother to see to it, that people don't either spend their time in a drug-induced haze or in front of video screens. Uh, don't knock my hobby. Здесь эта ужасающая скорость незаметна. Нет ни воздуха, который свистел бы в ушах, ни толчков, ни проносящихся мимо встречных предметов. Внешняя часть станции вращается, чтобы за счет центробежной силы создать ощущение тяжести и улучшить самочувствие людей. Познакомимся со станцией поближе. Imagine, if you can, a small room, hexagonal in shape like the cell of a bee. It is lighted neither by window nor by lamp, yet it is filled with a soft radiance. There are no apertures for ventilation, yet the air is fresh. There are no musical instruments. And yet, at the moment that my meditation opens, this room is throbbing with melodious sounds. An armchair is in the center. By its side a reading desk. That is all the furniture. And in the armchair there sits a swaddled lump of flesh. A woman, about five feet high, with a face as white as a fungus. It is to her that the little room belongs. An electric bell rang. The woman touched a switch, and the music was silent. I suppose I must see who it is, she thought, and set her chair in motion. The chair, like the music, was worked by machinery, and it rolled her to the other side of the room, where the bell still rang importunately. "'Who is it?' she called. Her voice was irritable, for she had been interrupted often since the music began. She knew several thousand people. In certain directions human intercourse had advanced enormously. But when she listened into the receiver, her white face wrinkled into smiles, and she said, Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Stanley worked for a company in a big building where he was employee number 427. Employee number 427's job was simple. He sat at his desk in room 427 and he pushed buttons on the keyboard. Orders came to him through a monitor on his desk, telling him what buttons to push, how long to push them, and in what order. This is what employee 427 did every day of every month of every year. And although others might have considered it soul-winning, Stanley relished every moment that the orders came in, as though he had been made exactly for this job. And Stanley was happy. It seems on the one hand you're saying, we don't, we're nowhere near where we need to be in order to create a blueprint. But on the other hand, you're saying without being able to imagine a world where we aren't creating, where work isn't necessary, even though it doesn't seem to be, where that exploitation isn't necessary, a post-work world, without being able to conceive of that, we won't be able to even develop a left project, let alone actually achieve uh, our that aim, which I think should be the common aim now. Um, so 
But it seems to me that we need some sort of blueprint, if even if it's one that has to be radically revised as we go along. Um, we have to have a way of thinking about this post-work future, and it can't be, like you point out, something like the, uh, the basic income, um, because that kind of uh, solution, for, for, uh, you know that that uh, you know the state won't be able to pay for everyone's basic income unless they're collecting taxes from corporations and workers who are set up in that same system. That, that there's nowhere for that in, that income to come from, except from capitalist exploitation. So that's not a solution. That's just uh, another modification to what we already have. Um, so I mean, we, I can start to like see. I can say no to things, but it's hard for me to say yes to things. And uh, do, and I see. I but I think that we need to start saying yes to some ideas. I don't. I don't disagree with that. It just seems to me that uh, first of all, I think no has become extremely important. I think. Uh, I think the left in the larger sense of the word, has gone down a series of rabbit holes. I think anti-imperialism is one mm -hmm. uh, that are rabbit holes and are based on a romantic notion that if the oppressed, in this case the imperialized, rise up, they will be in control of their own fate and that will be a spark that will then ignite the metropolitan areas as well. Uh, it never works. Right. It do, it's one thing to be against imperialist oppression. It's another thing to see imperialist oppression as the be all and end all of what's wrong with the world. Right. It's the same thing with uh, anti-racist politics in general, which is... I, to, I agree. Um which, you know, and this is, it doesn't make you very popular to say it, but it's like, of course, you have to be against the way the police behave towards uh, black people in America. That is uh, something that we should fight against. But changing cops' attitudes or even every white person's attitudes uh, about race in America would not overcome even that problem, let alone, you know, the vast slew of other problems uh, that all sorts of people, black and white, face every day as, you know, not rich people in America. So, you know, I, we have to go beyond just reacting to the various ugly symptoms of a system that's driven with this central contradiction. Um, and here's the thing. The best that I've been able to discover on the left are people like yourself who can say that. But when someone like Trump gets elected, that's all they can say, and that isn't enough to create a politics around. I, it, doesn't, it seems to me. Yes and no, because uh, one of the many problems with identity politics is that it really assumes that the structure of society is a function of people's attitudes. Right. And that, um, and then it takes those attitudes and reifies it as a system. Uh, so racism as a system, sexism as a system. It's one thing to say that it's an extremely pervasive mode of viewing the world and of reacting to the world, it's another thing to say that, that it grounds itself as a system. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned like the police, because I was just reading a book review actually from last week's New York Times book section about um, the turn to much more punitive policing starting in the 1970s and going through, you know, with Nixon's law and order and then Reagan and then Clinton. 
uh, and pointing out that because one, at least one of the books that was reviewed raised the question of how did this happen in cities where you had black mayors for the first time? Right. Uh, and the example was Washington, D.C. And what was clear, which the reviewer actually mentioned and then didn't go into detail about, is that they were responding to a massive social crisis. He gave figures about the, the, the rise of drug use in black neighborhoods in the 1960s, which is a st- rise as steep as the rise of meth in white working class communities in the past 10 years. So the, que- the real question is, that can't be re- that can't be solved on an atti- attitudinal level. One has to find out what kind of social crisis is being expressed in the rise of drug use, which frequently then goes hand in hand with the rise of crime, which frequently goes in hand with the notion of policing that you have to sort of arrest people right away, like for you know a crack in their windshield. Uh, because that will sort of stop the problem at its source. Right. So it's a much larger set of issues. And if you don't have the notion that that industrial labor has been going downhill in this country for the past half century, and that the first people to be affected by it were ironically African Americans, and I say ironically because there is a simultaneity between the civil rights movement and the beginning of the decline, relative decline, of black workers in northern cities. And there's a contradiction there and could help us explain the turn also to a different kind of politics. Uh, Or now, Trump, because our point point of departure is Trump. It's not only that so many working class whites and lower middle class have for 30 years gotten their view of the world from Fox News and talk radio, but also because their situation has has declined. It's a declining class. And if that isn't addressed, they're going to go right. And if they're just told that it, that the whole problem of society is their white skin privilege, well, for them to be told that they have our privilege is a bitter joke. And I think their identity politics has become generative of a new identity, which is white which is the identity of a declining working class. I mean, I don't want to deny that the white working class in this country is racist and has been racist for a long time. I don't want to deny that. Racist, homophobic, sexist. But those aren't self-grounding categories. Right. Uh, And Trump was elected as a backlash as people who see themselves on a downward trajectory, who deeply resent the fact that liberals, who tend to be much better off than they are, uh, speak for the people who are below them, but never for them. Right. And I think that uh, the left has to grapple with that and has not been. And I think there's an enormous amount of pressure, certainly on university campuses, which are rife with forms of identity politics that are, I think, out of control. Yeah. Well, you know, here's uh, here's the thing. Two two things come to me right now. One is that if you think that you have to find a replacement for this 
working class, which was going to grow and become bigger and bigger and bigger, and and the new driving force of history to replace the capitalist dynamic. Um, I'm not sure if I'm using the words correctly there or the the lingo correctly there, but if if that's what you think, that and you need to find a new subject, then um, I think you're going to be very attached to the, the idea of championing um, the oppressed uh, in in at in staying at that level. Just uh, you know, I think it explains a lot, but it may not explain everything. I mean, I've run across people who say that you should, simply should not critique Black Lives Matter if you are white or not black, um, and because you know you you don't have their lived experience, um, which uh, obviously is an absurd position, right? That's that's irrational, basically. Um, uh, critique and and argumentation is the way we we think through and and understand things. So you everyone needs to be able to critique. Um, and it but what's strange is even and it obviously it's not really something people mean because once a a person who is black say critiques Black Lives Matter, they become white anyway. Uh, so, uh, but I I just I, I think that. Um, on the one hand, the left has this problem of searching for a new subject, but something else is going on too to really ground this kind of identity politics. I think that the identity politics has been there for a half century. And I think that it is a very difficult problem because if I may move back to a higher level of abstraction just for a minute. Go go for it. I think that one of the things that has characterized, one of the many things that has characterized uh, capitalist modernity for the past 300 years has been the simultaneous generation of a form of universalism which is homogenizing and a reaction to that, which not only emphasizes the particular, but becomes particularistic. And that usually has taken the form, or it had until recently, taken the form of nationalism and particularly cultural nationalism, like the sort of nationalism that was developed first in Germany and is associated with, you know, German romantic nationalism of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And I think a lot of people don't take, the reason I'm going to this level of abstraction is because frequently people take one pole of capitalism to be the whole thing. In particular, they take the abstract homogenizing dimension to be the whole thing and therefore sort of find themselves drawn to particularism as the answer. I think this helps explain why so many intellectuals in the United States seem not to realize that the particularism of really great and significant deeply reactionary thinkers like Carl Schmitt or Heidegger are really reactionary. I don't think they fully understand it. They see that there's a brilliant critique of modernity. And I'm trying to say that if you grasp capitalist modernity as having these two poles, then it's really the critique of one from the dimension of the other. And I think this became replicated in the 1960s when, on the one hand, African-American movements, black power movements, were an attempt to not only reject racism, but reject a notion of integration that would deny the particularity of, let's say, black lived experience. But I think that's a very delicate balance to maintain 
Because what you're trying to do, it seems to me, is at least tacitly come up with a new notion of universality that can encompass difference. But instead, what happened was the slide into difference Mm -hmm. in and of itself. And therefore, you cannot speak about Black Lives Matter because your intellect makes no difference. You're not black. I think this is deeply reactionary. Oh, I agree. I agree. But uh, um, I think it's not only because it was aimed at me. I mean, I think, you know, I, I didn't like being told that myself, but I don't think it's just not a very... It's just not. I don't think the per, I don't think the person who was making that claim would have made it if they had understood it as being as reactionary as it was. You know, it was really. But that's true. I, I think this is true of a lot of people. Yeah. And what appears to be radical is radical, quote unquote, but it's basically right wing radical, and people don't really understand that. And it's di- but it's important to maintain that position in the hope that maybe people will learn to talk to people about it. But I find it very difficult. I don't think it's accidental. This is a side point. Black Lives Matter now has their own credit card. <laughs> well, have you seen that? No. But it's, it's true. It's, Black it's, Lives Matter is split into This is not a, Go ahead. a Saturday Night Live jibe on my part. Okay. Well, what what organization actually is putting that out? It, Dude. It's Black Lives Matter. Okay. And they have their own, and I'm not sure whether it's Master or uh, uh, MasterCard or uh, Visa, and a proportion will go to black businesses. It's a movement of the black small bourgeoisie. Right. That part of it is. I mean, it didn't, it started and still continues to be in some places, uh, you know, often enough. A, a spontaneous resistance to real oppression on the ground, you know. Absolutely, and, um, absolutely. But but that real oppression, let's say Ferguson, mm-hmm. that real oppression has structural roots. In Ferguson's case, it has to do with you know municipalities being so broke that their only source of revenue is police shaking down blacks. Basically, that's what it is. It's a shaking. It's a shakedown, a state uh, sanctioned shakedown scheme for revenues, which, of course, has to be rejected. But behind that is the question, why are the municipalities so broke? Now, I think that's worth investigating. But I think there's a larger question of the way things are financed in the United States with the structure of American federalism. Which may have been one thing when the originalists were original, but means something completely different now. So it's a political problem and not a... a... Well, it is a... The political framework has itself helped generate socioeconomic... has exacerbated socioeconomic problems. Well, listen, we should... should, I should have you on again... Um, sometime if you're open to that, because I I feel like we just scratched the surface in this conversation, but it's been an hour, and I don't want to hold you all day. Um, but is there anything I didn't ask you about, or that you'd like to say before we close out the conversation? Uh, not that I can think of offhand. Not because I think we've exhausted everything. We're far from it. Yeah. But uh, I don't see one keystone sentence that would now you know, put the entire thing into place. 